Part 3. The Destructive Labor Camps Chapter 1. The Fingers of Aurora Rosy-fingered Eos, so often mentioned in Homer and called Aurora by the Romans, caressed, too, with those fingers the first early morning of the archipelago. When our compatriots heard via the BBC that M. Mihajlov claimed to have discovered that concentration camps had existed in our country as far back as 1921, many of us, and many in the West, too, were astonished. That early, really, even in 1921? Of course not. Of course Mihajlov was in error. In 1921, in fact, Concentration camps were already in full flower, already even coming to an end. And how could it have been otherwise? Let us pause to ponder. Didn't Marx and Engels teach that the old bourgeois machinery of compulsion had to be broken up, and a new one created immediately in its place? And included in the machinery of compulsion were the army, we are not surprised that the Red Army was created at the beginning of 1918. The police, the militia was inaugurated even sooner than the army. The courts, from November 22, 1917. And the prisons. How, in establishing the dictatorship of the proletariat, could they delay with a new type of prison? That is to say that it was altogether impermissible to delay in the matter of prisons whether old or new. In the first months after the October Revolution, Lenin was already demanding the most decisive draconic measures to tighten up discipline. And are draconic measures possible without prison? What new could the proletarian state contribute here? Lenin was feeling out new paths. In December 1917, he suggested for consideration the following assortment of punishments. Confiscation of all property, confinement in prison, dispatch to the front and forced labor for all who disobey the existing law. Thus we can observe that the leading idea of the archipelago, forced labor, had been advanced in the first month after the October Revolution. And even while sitting peacefully among the fragrant hay mowings of Raslev and listening to the buzzing bumblebees, Lenin could not help but ponder the future penal system. Even then, he had worked things out and reassured us. The suppression of the minority of exploiters by the majority of the hired slaves of yesterday is a matter so comparatively easy, simple and natural, that it is going to cost much less in blood, will be much cheaper for humanity, than the preceding suppression of the majority by the minority. According to the estimates of emigre professor of statistics Kurganov, this comparatively easy internal repression cost us, from the beginning of the October Revolution up to 1959, a total of 66 million, 66 million lives. We, of course, cannot vouch for his figure, but we have none other that is official. And just as soon as the official figure is issued, the specialists can make the necessary critical comparisons. It is interesting to compare other figures. How large was the total staff of the central apparatus of the terrifying Tsarist Third Department, which runs like a strand through all the great Russian literature? At the time of its creation, it had 16 persons, and at its height, it had 45 a ridiculously small number even for the remotest Cheka provincial headquarters in the country. Or how many political prisoners did the February Revolution find in the Tsarist prison of the peoples? All these figures do exist somewhere. In all probability, there were more than a hundred such prisoners in the Kresty prison alone, and several hundred returned from Siberian exile and hard labor, and how many more were languishing in the prison of every provincial capital? But it is interesting to know exactly how many. Here is a figure for Tambov, taken from the fiery local papers. The February Revolution, which opened wide doors of the Tambov prison, found their political prisoners in the number of seven persons. And there were more than forty provinces. It is superfluous to recall that from February to July 1917, 
there were no political arrests, and after July the number imprisoned could be counted on one's fingers. Here, however, was the trouble. The first Soviet government was a coalition government, and a portion of the people's commissariats had to be allotted, like it or not, to the left SRs, including, unhappily, the People's Commissariat of Justice, which fell to them. Guided by rotten, petty, bourgeois concepts of freedom, this People's Commissariat of Justice brought the penal system to the verge of ruin. The sentences turned out to be too light, and they made hardly any use at all of the progressive principle of forced labor. In February 1918, the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars, Comrade Lenin, demanded that the number of places of imprisonment be increased and that the repression of criminals be intensified, and in May, already going over to concrete guidance, he gave instructions that the sentence for bribery must be not less than ten years of prison and ten years of forced labor in addition, i.e., a total of twenty years. This scale might seem pessimistic at first. Would forced labor really be necessary after twenty years? But we know that forced labor turned out to be a very long-lived measure, and that even after fifty years it would still be extremely popular. The reader has already read the term concentration camp, Kanzleger, several times in the sentences of the tribunals and concluded, perhaps, that we were guilty of an error of making careless use of terminology subsequently developed? No, this is not the case. In August 1918, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin wrote in a telegram to the Yevgenia Bosch and to the Penza Provincial Executive Committee, they were unable to cope with a peasant revolt, lock up all the doubtful ones. Not guilty, mind you, but doubtful. In a concentration camp outside the city, and in addition, carry out merciless mass terror. This was before the decree. Only on September 5th, 1918, ten days after this telegram, was the decree on the Red Terror published. In addition to the instructions on mass executions, it stated in particular, Secure the Soviet Republic against its class enemies by isolating them in concentration camps. So that is where this term concentration camps, was discovered and immediately seized upon and confirmed, one of the principal terms of the twentieth century, and it was to have a big international future. And this is when it was born, in August and September 1918. The word itself had already been used during World War I, but in relation to POWs and undesirable foreigners. But here in 1918, it was, for the first time, apply to the citizens of one's own country. There is no one now to tell us about most of those first concentration camps, and only from the last testimony of those few surviving first concentration camp inmates can we glean and preserve a little bit. At that time, the authorities used to love to set up their concentration camps in former monasteries. They were enclosed by strong walls, had good solid buildings, and they were empty. After all, monks are not human beings and could be tossed out at will. Here is how they fed them in a camp in 1921. Half a pound of bread, plus another half pound for those who fulfilled the norm, hot water for tea morning and evening, and during the day a ladle of gruel, with several dozen grains and some potato peelings in it. Camp life was embellished, on the one hand, by the denunciations of provocateurs and arrests on the basis of denunciations, and on the other by dramatics and glee club. They gave concerts for the people of Ryzan in the hall of the former nobleman's assembly, and the Deprivees brass band played in the city park. The Deprivees got better and better acquainted with and more friendly with the inhabitants, and this became intolerable and at that point they began to send the so-called war prisoners to the northern special-purpose camps. The lesson of the instability and laxity in these concentration camps lay in their being surrounded by civilian life, and that was why the special northern camps were required. Concentration camps were abolished in 1922. 
This whole dawn of the camps deserves to have its spectrum examined much more closely, and glory to him who can, for all I have in my own hands is crumbs. At the end of the Civil War, the two labor armies created by Trotsky had to be dissolved because of the grumbling of the soldiers kept in them, and by this token, the role of the camps in the structure of the RSFSR not only did not diminish but intensified. By the end of 1920, in the RSFSR, there were 84 camps in 43 provinces. If one believes the official statistics, even though classified, 25,336 persons and, in addition, 24,400 prisoners of war of the Civil War were held in them at this time. Both figures, particularly the second, seem to be understated. However, if one takes into consideration what, however, if one takes into consideration that by unloading prisons, sinking barges, and other types of mass annihilation, the figure had often begun with zero and been reduced to zero over and over, then perhaps these figures are accurate. On the threshold of the reconstruction period, meaning from 1927, the role of camps was growing. Now just what was one to think, now after all the victories, against the most dangerous hostile elements, wreckers, the Kulaks, counter-revolutionary propaganda. And so it was that the archipelago was not about to disappear into the depths of the sea. The archipelago would live. End of Part 3, Chapter 1